Today, I'm going to talk to you about a project that I did on publication hacking um, with a, a team of coworkers at Flatiron Health, where we went from a research question to a manuscript in only two days. And that's why we played the final countdown for my intro music, because it really was basically like a final countdown. So a little bit about my story to give you some context. Um, so I came from the world of academic biostatistics um, from Penn, and then I was a faculty member at Cleveland Clinic, as Jared mentioned, for several years. Um, and the research was really exciting, um, but one thing I grew frustrated with over time was the length of the publication and grant cycle. It sometimes felt like it was months to years before we would get publications out. And so a little over two years ago, um, I made the move to tech um, and healthcare technology specifically to work at Flatiron Health because I was really interested in a faster pace and a potential for more immediate impact to my work. And so a little bit about what we do at, at Flatiron as um, we go into this example. So our mission is to serve cancer patients um, by dramatically improving treatment and accelerating research. Emphasis for this talk on accelerating. We're gonna come back to that in a moment. So how do we do that? Well, we do that by processing oncology electronic health record data at scale. And so that comes from a variety of different sources. So that can come from structured data that live in electronic health records, um, which we standardize and process. We have a team of software engineers and medical informaticists who work really hard um, to make this into to research grade quality data. We also process unstructured data. And so by unstructured, I mean the um, scan documents and the clinician notes. Um, and radiology reports where a lot of the information with the deep clinical context lies. And so we use a combination of humans with clinical training and technology to process that data. Then we combine it together into a, a contemporary data set of world world data on oncology patients. <laughs> Another really cool thing about working in tech and working at Flatiron is the hackathons that we do. So two, for two days, once every quarter, we um, devote time for experiments and prototypes. And so everyone gets a chance to work on some kind of project that they otherwise wouldn't have time for. And we think about success here based on learning and doing something. So not necessarily um, a traditional positive successful outcome, but how we think about it is if you're not um, at risk of failing at some point, maybe you're not um, taking enough chances and doing it right. Um, so we um, combine tech and non-tech for this. And at the end, all you might have is a, a duct tape demo, and it could be things like product improvements, it could be new tools, um, new data analyses, or um, also an opportunity, as our CTO Gil likes to say, to liberally fix shit. So some examples of other hackathons that I've worked on personally in the past um, to set this up. So they range from both really practical to really impractical and from wildly successful to total failures. So one thing I did last year, I worked with a software engineer and we worked on our cold brew keg monitoring. So we have a, a keg of cold brew coffee in the office, but it was running out a lot and we couldn't really predict when it was running out. And this was a disaster <laughs> every time it ran out. And so we hacked together, we had this Raspberry Pi and this like electronic joystick and we actually did literally tape things together to try to monitor the cold brew keg situation. Um, also worked on a project in the past where I uh, collaborated with someone to turn our data and signals from the data into music that we played in a demo. Um, on the more kind of practical and successful side, um, collaborated on a Shiny app to um, predict survival in cancer patients. And on the total failure side, there was one hackathon where the only thing I had to show at the end of the two days was that picture of a whiteboard with math that didn't make any sense. <laughs> and so I put that up in the demo and I said, well, it turns out this problem is a lot harder than I thought. So in that sense, it actually was a success because I learned that. So the hackathon project I'm gonna talk to you about today, we actually did just a month ago. Um, so this is very fresh. And remember back to what I said about accelerating research in my transition from academia to tech where I really wanted this faster pace. So that's been delivered so many times over at Flatiron. I've really seen us move shockingly fast and accomplish more than I ever could have thought. But the one area where I still felt like we had a lot of room to grow was in the time to process publications to get drafts of publications out the door for, for submission. And so I thought, you know, 
I really know that we can hack this publication preparation process somehow. We have all of these tools and we have these different ways of working. Let's try it. So I somehow convinced four of my colleagues for this crazy idea of going from just a research question, so one sentence about a research question we were doing, to a drafted publication in two days. Um, so the team, the core team, was myself and Eris Ellis, who is another quantitative scientist on our team, the QS team. Um, someone from medical writing, my colleague Rana, Ken, an oncologist, and um, Kelly, our project manager. And so, I don't know, either they really believed this or they were just crazy, but they said that they would try it with me. So we thought about the timeline and the numbers just did not add up. So we both had to plan the analysis, do the analysis, and write a manuscript draft, which is way faster than it usually happens, either in academia, industry, or even what we had done so far at Flatiron. So in my past, like, it had taken me months sometimes to go through this process of analyzing, writing, iterating, revising. Um, and what we were proposing was a Thursday and a Friday. And so people thought we were crazy. They, they thought, there's, like, there's no way you can do this. It's good that you're trying, but you can't accomplish this. One of my favorites was one of our coworkers said, jokingly, but, but also kind of seriously, that this was a fool's errand that we were about to embark on. But we tried it anyway. And so a little bit about our topic. So what we looked at was pseudoprogression in the world world. What do I mean by that? So for cancer patients, newer therapies that have come out in the last few years um, are immunotherapies, which actually harness a patient's immune system to fight the tumors. And so rather than um, patients getting better with tumors decreasing in size, it can actually lead to transient immune-related increases in tumor size. So it looks like the cancer is getting worse, but it's actually just the immune system reacting. And sometimes those actually then eventually shrink. And that's something called pseudoprogression. And so although people have studied this in clinical trials, there's actually really limited data and understanding about this in real world settings, which are much less controlled than in a clinical trial population, as well as the rate of, of pseudoprogression, as well as the factors associated with it. And this was a really great project for us to work on that we were uniquely positioned to tackle because our data are relatively large for this kind of a population. And so we could see this, this pretty rare event they're also recent, so it only takes 30 days to get from a patient being seen in the clinic into a processed analytic data set that we have, so we could see really contemporary patterns. Um, also that high quality that I mentioned, all the processing and quality improvement that we put into it, and then the longitudinal nature that allowed us to see these changes over time. So this, as you can imagine, was not easy. We faced a lot of challenges. So the first one was, how do we find the time? So this is a screenshot, actually, of the, the core group's calendars for a week of trying to uh, actually find the time to do this. So luckily, the hackathon gave us um, a good opportunity to actually carve out those two days. Um, but we still had to work to really make sure that that happened. Also, believe it or not, finding space. So at a rapidly scaling tech company, we've really been doubling in size, I think, every year that I've been there. Um, we have an open office space, and often they're actually, it's hard to find a kind of a quiet place to work together without interruptions. So we had to work with our office ops team to actually secure some space. So focus is another thing. So we use Slack. I don't know how many people here use Slack. Awesome. So it is totally essential for having us be able to talk to each other and communicate on our projects. But the problem was that people would Slack us with questions about other things. So this was actually before the Slack statuses came out last week. Um, but so we wrote our own statuses to say that we were hacking, please don't disturb us. And my favorite was uh, my colleague Aristellus who said, hackity hack, don't Slack back, <laughs> which turned out to be really effective. No one Slacked her. <laughs> um, so you know, how did, we, how did we do this, what the process was like? So luckily, we had this awesome project manager, Kelly, who was able to really plan out and take, go through all the different parts of what needed to be done for the different objectives and the different roles and plan that out over this two-week period. There's no way I could have done this kind of planning myself. So this was really critical. <clears throat> so here's what I bet you all really want to hear about, the code development process. How did we write the code and use R to make this happen? So, First, 
just want to remember this only was able to happen because we have done so much extensive pre-work with our software engineers and our medical informatics team to make sure that we have standardized high quality data that we can then use right away for analyses. So that really cuts out on a lot of the early stages. The second, and I'm going to dive a little deeper into this in a moment, but we have a common set of R packages and technical infrastructure. Something we tried for this project that we hadn't done before was to do independent parallel coding for cohort selection. So um, the other quantitative scientist and myself, um, we both actually wrote the code for the cohort selection independently at the same time. That way we didn't have to be gated on code review for the next step to fill out the other objectives. So we figured if we got to all of the same numbers, that was enough to at least proceed further and then we could go back and review it later. And so we kind of gamified this a little bit. We are super competitive. So we said, OK, for each step in the cohort selection criteria, we're going to try to match numbers. And as soon as we get to them, we'll write them on the whiteboard. But we actually would run to the whiteboard <laughs> to write the numbers down. And one person would write a number down, and then the other person would write it, and it would match. Um, and then we would high five and then go run back to our computers and write some more code. So um, it turned out for us, racing was really effective. Um, once we got the cohort in place, then we could actually divide up the coding for the next sections, and we split objective one and objective two between the two of us, and then so we both got started working on those. Um, and then later did code review um, in Fabricator, which is the tool that we use for code review, um, and then used some of our regular tools like GitLab for version control. So we are at an R conference. I figured you all want to hear about some of the R packages that we use that really made this effective. So I know Andrew Gelman said yesterday that the, the Hadleyverse is bigger than our current uh, galaxy or universe or something like that. But uh, I don't know if that exactly is true. But what we do know is that those packages really makes our lives much quicker and easier. And also having a shared common understanding going into the project that these would be the packages that we use and having style guides around them allowed us to move faster. So we didn't have to stop and think along the way. Um, we also have a, another package of, called Flatiron R, which is an internal package that we've developed that has a lot of um, Flatiron Health specific functions, um, such as things to help us connect to our databases um, or standardize data across databases. For example, like our um, dates are in different formats in different databases. And rather than manually converting all the dates, um, we have a lot of helper functions that just do that without us even thinking about it that we've written. Um, it also has some functions that help us more easily work across the different kinds of SQL databases that we have. So we have a combination of MS SQL and Postgres SQL databases. And so this allows us to work between the two and also map across internal identifiers. Um, and so we also have, so this is a um, oncology research, so we use a lot of survival analysis. And so we have some helper functions in our internal package that allow us to standardize the ways that we calculate censoring and survival time using our data in particular. Um, and some really great functions based on high charter that my colleague Josh Kraut wrote um, that standardize how we present them. And so if anyone here has written a medical um, research paper for publication, you know that it's really critical to write what we call a table one, because it's always the first table. So this is a table of baseline characteristics. Um, and there's really nothing that dramatically difficult about this, but to get the details right and also get the formatting right and do it really quickly actually takes a lot of time. So there's this really awesome package called compare groups that we use, and we have some helper functions around it to help us get really quickly to an extensive table of baseline characteristics. So we love compare groups package. My cat, Bear Monkey, he was less impressed. That, this is with a printout of the table one for the hackathon project that you can see he kind of ripped into with his teeth that evening. So um, he doesn't like it as much as I do, but that's OK. So did we do this? Shockingly, we actually managed to pull it off. No idea how we did it. Well, actually, I do. I'm going to tell you in a moment how we did it. But um, at the end of the two days, we had a draft of a manuscript. Um, and you'll see the, the, the number of times that Hero by Enrique Iglesias was played. That's an estimate, but I don't know. It kept coming up on our playlist, and then we just kept playing it over and over again. So I think that's kind of the secret sauce behind this, to be honest. Um, 
so we got to a manuscript draft at the end of those two days, but we did need to schedule kind of a, a, like a finish up day, which was just two days ago, actually, um, where we reran the code with updated data. Since our data are updated each month, we actually had a bigger and newer sample size um, now. And so we actually, um, after updating that, we found some really, some significant differences in the populations. And what I think are some really interesting signals in the data um, that we're really excited about. So as a next step, we have a draft ready. Um, we're just getting review from a few other folks um, at the company and then submitting it for publication. So in addition to the study that we were doing on pseudoprogression, our project manager, Kelly, led a parallel study, which was almost like an ethnography of these researchers trying to observe us and look for patterns in what we were doing that was successful or not successful. And so these are some of the themes that she found after observing us and um, documenting some quotes from us along the way, things like um, empowerment through having the right decision makers in the room at all times. Um, the enhancement to collaboration through having um, uninterrupted time and a really trusting in-depth partnership between people. Um, also just the learning and the morale boost. I can't even tell you how exciting this was for everybody. It really just reinvigorated just our general excitement for the work that we were doing. So what made this work in the end? So when we actually thought about these lessons that we learned, we wrote down a few things that we think were really deciding factors. So the first is the, the data and the technical infrastructure, emphasis on the R there. Um, without R in general and the tools that we have built up over time as a community of R users in the company, um, there's no way we would have been able to move this quickly. Also, the lack of context switching is really key. I think for us, and really for everybody these days, um, going back and forth from so many projects, it's really easy to forget how much time you lose by context switching. And when your head is really in it, um, you really don't have to waste that time kind of getting your head back in to think about it. Um, so the way we parallelize some of the work streams ended up being really effective. I think often in regular work, we do things one after another rather than in parallel. Um, and so that really saved a lot of time here. So also the strong and clear communication. Um, this is obviously important. I think the, the people who were involved, making sure that we were really explicit about a lot of the decisions we were communicating, as well as just being in the same physical room to help that go quicker and easier. And then I think accountability to a timeline. Because we said we need to get this done in two days, um, we actually had that detailed timeline that you saw. We were able to say, well, we need to get this done in the next hour or the next half hour. And that really pushes things forward as well as not just setting up the timeline, but being accountable to the timeline and checking in on it. Um, and then the last is they were just a really fun, positive group of people um, that worked really well together. And I think that there's something to be said for just people who get along really well and are able to, to communicate well and work together. And the last thing is, I think, in terms of the decision making. Um, this is something I've been thinking more about since then, is that when you have an infinite amount of time, the way you make decisions is different than when you have a limited amount of time. And so just the different kinds of criteria that you're optimizing for and how you actually land on that decision just inherently changes when you uh, change the, the time that you have to make the decision. And so we finished the project, but what happens next? Is this just left or do we do more with it? So there's been really exciting reception and uptake across the company in the last few weeks since this happened. So we won second place for best data hack. I know, I think, I thought this was a really good, I thought we would win first place. <laughs> um, but it just shows you what tough competition there was and what other really amazing projects there were that this was second place. Um, we got some really great feedback from um, senior leadership um, saying things like, um, that we didn't just pilot a process for drafting a manuscript, that we showed what it means to do science, um, which, was, which was really heartening to hear. Um, we also took some of those lessons that learned and created a, a two-page document that tried to distill um, what we found so that we could share that more broadly, um, and then generate buy-in with leadership in the company and iterate on the process. And so this is my absolute favorite part, which I was not expecting would move so quickly. In the last few weeks since we did this, we have already had three different projects either start or be planned using similar versions of this process to experiment with, not as part of hackathons, but as part of just our regular work. 
So that's been really exciting to see that happen. And so I just want to thank, there were, um, in addition to the core team, there were so many other people who needed um, to help us and collaborate with us to make this happen, um, as well as uh, just one shameless plug to join our team. We are hiring. If you want to do this kind of quick and exciting work, um, I will be here for the rest of the day, or you can find me uh, by email or on Twitter. Thank you.